Uh, hello, good afternoon everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today and welcome to our uh, Introduction to Jitterbit webinar. Uh, my name is Dom, uh, I'm a sales engineer at Jitterbit and uh, over the next 30 minutes or so I'd like to uh, uh, show you why our customers have uh, trusted Jitterbit to help them solve their integration challenges. Uh, as part of this introduction, I'm also going to give you a, a, a brief demonstration of Jitterbit just so you can get a feel for uh, how it, what it looks like and what it can do. Now, uh, we will take some time at the end of the webinar to answer any questions that arise. So, so if you do think of anything or have any queries as we go through, uh, please raise them in the questions panel of the uh, GoToMeeting uh, control panel. Uh, and then at the end, uh, well, Deb will collect them as we go through this, and at the end, she'll relay them to me, and we can uh, uh, take some time to address those at the end. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's move on. So I, I thought we'd kick off today by just um, thinking about a typical customer of Jitterbit, and this is Skull Candy. So, I mean, like, like many businesses, uh, Skullcandy's IT landscape has evolved really rapidly over recent years, uh, particularly as their online business has expanded and they've become a, a global franchise, so uh, they couldn't have believed the growth that they would have had a few years ago. Now, the issue here is this has resulted in an all-too-common scenario uh, of a really disjointed IT platform where they have multiple systems that work perfectly in isolation, you know, best of breed applications, but, but to deliver the real business benefit to their clients, uh, what they require is a sort of smooth flow of information between these systems. Uh, and their really stretched IT team have, have struggled to bring all those systems together. So rather than use traditional uh, integration approaches, uh, Skullcandy chose to uh, solve this problem by self-implementing Jitterbit. Uh, and effectively, they built a set of integrations that uh, have their systems as sources and targets with transformation mappings between them. Um, and they pulled these core systems together to support their, uh, uh, their digital business strategy going forwards. Uh, and, and this is really Jitterbit at its best, sort of working invisibly behind the scenes. Uh, and in this particular case, it took one person to implement Jitterbit, uh, where previously an entire IT team had struggled to deliver. Uh, so we'd love to be able to solve all our customers integration challenges like this. Uh, so this presentation is really about uh, introducing us what we do and how we go about doing it for uh, for our clients. So just to set the scenes and uh, give you a little bit of background about where, who Jitterbit are, the origins of Jitterbit can be traced back to actually 2004 uh, with the start of an open source project that was really designed to build an easy to use integration toolkit. Um, now that, that project was really helpful for us because that's where we cut our teeth and learnt about all the, the sort of business challenges that face users um, and we gradually worked out ways of solving each of these little technical challenges uh, until eventually we were mature enough that towards the beginning of this decade uh, we decided to actually take that out of the open source world and make the project commercial and it was at that point in 2011 that George Galagos joined Jitterbit to, uh, to sort of manage that transition into the commercial world. Now, one of the key milestones for us that sort of uh, shapes, uh, shapes Jitterbit was in 2012 when uh, Salesforce invited us to develop a replacement for uh, their sort of aged data loader tool. Now, this was a massive success for us, really, really popular, very widely used, and most importantly for us, it was really the start of our strategic relationship with Salesforce. Um, now, that tool was originally a client-server application, and our next big move in terms of the history of Jitterbit was to really move that from being a client-server application to a cloud-based application. So we did that whilst working very closely with Salesforce and drawing on all their software as a service experience so that the application we deployed was not just a specific uh, Salesforce uh, integration tool but a general purpose tool uh, which we call our Harmony platform. So that was in 2014 and really based on the success of that platform 
we very recently uh, received significant investment from, from KKR, uh, which has basically funded growth across the board for us. Uh, and the results of that have, have definitely been recognised by the industry and probably culminating in uh, earlier this year, Gartner uh, classifying Jitterbit as a leader in the uh, integration platform as a service uh, uh, quadrant. Um, so great credentials to have. So I think it's worth just thinking about, you know, is Jitterbit the right, uh, you know, uh, are you the right customer for Jitterbit, if you like, you know, can we help you out? Uh, so it's, it's quite a common question. Um, so what, what's the common underlying factor between our uh, between our customers? Well, essentially, they have integration challenges. So. Unfortunately, that doesn't narrow it down. We don't particularly specialise in one industry or one size of organisation. Our clients may be internationally recognised uh, multinationals, or they could be sort of one-man band startups, uh, and they could really come from from any industry. Uh, what we find is that really, as the world becomes ever more connected, we all face similar challenges of really getting the most out of our underlying technology. Uh, and all of our customers really have that driving force behind them, and they've chosen Jitterbit to, to, to help them. Uh, and the reasons for that, I think, can be boiled down into just a few uh, a few simple factors, really. Uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, we are, we are seen as iPaaS leaders. Uh, Gartner recognised us as leaders in this quadrant, and in fact, more than that, we're actually one of the fastest movers in this particular space. Uh, I believe showing that we have a very clear vision of the future, which Gartner have definitely picked up on, uh, and and we also have the capability to get there. So we're not just backwards looking; we're definitely very forwards looking. We also are not new players in this space, as I've mentioned already. We've been doing this for over a decade, and we've uh, uh, had a, an immense amount of feedback uh, from our, our customers. We understand the challenges in this space, so we have this deep domain expertise that our customers can draw on so we can help them uh, implement successful solutions. Another one of the uh, the key drivers that, uh, that, that uh, motivate our customers is really time to value. We know that the pace of change within business today is, is basically faster than ever and definitely it's only going in one direction, it's getting faster not slower. Uh, and we know that organisations just don't really have the resources or the time to invest in large time consuming integration projects. So uh, we know that and, and that's why we've spent a, a lot of our development activity building a platform that enables you to get results faster than any other approach. Um, and, and just to sort of illustrate that, I'll put some numbers on the uh, on that particular uh, issue. I can tell you that really 75% of our clients actually go live with a solution based on Jitterbit within one month of, of signing up. So that's pretty quick time to value. And coupled very much in hand with this time to value is the experience that we uh, that our customers get. So we actually have a 98% customer renewal rate. So as a, as a sort of software as a service business, that renewal rate is a really key metric for us. And uh, having a 98% renewal rate really basically illustrates that our customers are successful. And not only are they successful, they must be pretty happy with the solution because they keep coming back for more. Uh, and, and we take this very seriously in our whole organization from the sales team through the consultants, our support team, even our development team are all focused on ensuring your success so you come back for more. Uh, and in fact, we have a very special role in Jitterbit. One of the most important roles is our uh, customer success manager. So every one of our customers uh, is assigned a, a CSM and it's their absolute focus on ensuring that you have the best possible experience of working with Jitterbit and therefore come back for more. So uh, I think uh, I think that renewal rate sort of uh, illustrates quite clearly how uh, uh, you should have a superior experience uh, uh, when it comes to using Jitterbit. So we sort of know what we're talking about. Um, we're looking at another aspect of uh, why our customers choose us, uh, one of the initial questions everyone has is, well, can you Jitterbit actually support my, my applications that I want to integrate? So really, we, we've got a lot of experience in this. With over 10 years of integration experience, um, 
we've integrated hundreds and hundreds of different systems and really the key to this is the fact that Jitterbit uses open standards for integration. So here we're talking about things like uh, JDBC and ODBC for database access. We're talking about web service access through SOAP and RESTful web services. We're talking about various sort of file structures, XML, JSON, CSV, you know, could be any old uh, uh, file structures, perhaps accessed via file systems, file shares, maybe even through secure FTP sites, that sort of thing. They're all completely these sort of open standard uh, uh, mechanisms so if your applications support any of these open standards then yes we, we can integrate with those but we've also taken this a little bit uh, higher level and for our uh, more complex enterprise endpoints then we actually provide native enterprise connectors so really what we've done here is we've hidden all the complexity of the un uh, underlying uh, API and wrap them up as sort of wizard driven processes uh, that you can use to uh, sort of coach you through the configuration of how to uh, integrate with any of these enterprise applications. And we do actually provide another level on top of that which is um, uh, the fact that what we've done is we've, we've developed specific solutions for the most common integration types uh, and these are what we call jitter packs. So they basically act as templates so that we know that many people want to integrate let's say Salesforce and NetSuite and they want to take account objects and order objects and opportunities and uh, contacts you know so the mapping is pretty much the same for every one of our clients so rather than having to build everything from scratch you use a jitter pack that has the most common objects mapped already and then all our customers need to do is tweak those uh, uh, those common templates in order to account for their particular customizations, which is a lot quicker than building everything from uh, uh, fr from scratch. So that's the key to uh, uh, what we can actually integrate in terms of endpoints. Um, but we do have various different mechanisms or various different integration types uh, that, that our clients are actually implementing. So I'll just take a moment or two to uh, uh, think about the different levels of uh, integration that we perform. So the first one is, is purely straightforward data synchronization. Uh, so these are typically involving two systems, a source and a target, and they quite often have some sort of transformation logic uh, because you know uh, the, the source and the target structures are not necessarily absolutely identical you might want to change formats change data structures do some sort of logic around them uh, so uh, this would be typical uh, uh, data synchronization activity and they could be uh, both ways so you know a typical example would be where I want to take product information out of an ERP and push it into a CRM uh, but at the same time I might also want to take information out of my CRM and synchronize it with my uh, with my back-end ERP uh, and as I say there could be transformations involved uh, mapping the structures from one system to another another typical example is is really an archiving type activity uh, so a common example of this is where people want to take information say out of a CRM map it through to a, uh, a relational database so that they can make use of uh, business intelligence reporting applications um, that are perhaps better than the native CRM reporting applications. Uh, the difference here is generally speaking you don't need to do any transformation on the data it's more like a replication or an archiving type activity and in fact uh, when it comes to Salesforce this is such a common requirement for us that actually or our clients that we've built a tool what we call cloud replicate which is uh, an additional extra but essentially this will out of the box uh, point at a, uh, a Salesforce organization, point at a relational database and effectively uh, map everything out of Salesforce into a relational database including all your custom objects, custom fields and we can do that on a, uh, a um, sort of dynamic basis, an ongoing basis uh, to keep the two things in sync. So really, data synchronization covers a huge, uh, a, a huge number of um, 
uh, number of processes. Most of these processes though are scheduled, they're batch oriented processes and that really doesn't work for all, uh, uh, all workflows. Uh, so when it comes to real-time integration then you can also do that with, with Jitterbit as well. So a typical example might be something like an end user updating a CRM and our business uh, business rules say that you know when when that uh, record inside my CRM is updated, I automatically want to push those changes through to the ERP as well. Uh, so really, I need a real time integration there. Now, in the Jitterbit world, the integration itself is exactly the same as a uh, data synchronization in terms of the way you build them. The only difference is you don't uh, run it on the schedule. But you deploy it as, it as an API so that you can then trigger it from within your CRM system. So in something like Salesforce, what you do is you build a workflow rule that says when this account is updated, then I want to call a Jitterbit API or send a message to the Jitterbit API with the uh, object ID. The Jitterbit uh, API then triggers the, the integration to run and the magic happens behind the scenes. So you get that very dynamic uh, uh, real-time integration. And actually you can build on this real-time integration. This example here is really just point to point. But very often uh, you want to do something a little bit more complex and this is what we would call process orchestration. So as an example, if you take the example of uh, up updating an opportunity to say actually yes this opportunity is now closed, we've won it, um, that would typically trigger a business process that says okay I now need to take the information about this opportunity and then inside my ERP I need to create an order and then um, that's actually a more complex process so there are a number of different things that have to happen there so inside from a Jitterbit perspective this is a sort of orchestration exercise and usually the uh, uh, the output of this orchestration exercise is that something goes back the other way so these are very bi-directional in this case once uh, uh, an order is created in the ERP that order will have a, an ID um, but for uh, sort of complete integrity you'd want to take that order ID and map it back to the opportunity inside your CRM so that you've closed the loop on this uh, and so this is a bit more complex in terms of how you build your integrations but the logic is all there and uh, Jitterbit is definitely used for, um, uh, for these sorts of things. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you a demo in a moment, but just before I do, I wanted to set the scene in terms of uh, explain the different components that you get as far as the Jitterbit platform. So I'm not going to go into any technical detail here. If you want a, a follow up in terms of uh, the technical architecture, then you know, happy to do that for you as a uh, outside this particular webinar. But just to illustrate some of the key points here, the, the big sort of grey box in the centre here is the Harmony platform. So this is really the heart of what we do. It acts as the repository for all of your integrations. It acts as the uh, sort of configuration metadata associated with your Jitterbit organisation. And it also acts as the uh, repository for the monitoring capabilities that we have inside, uh, inside Jitterbit. And in order to use the Harmony platform or change the configurations, use the monitoring, we have a web-based tool that we call our Web Management Console, uh, which is really how you administer the Harmony platform. We do have another tool that you can use, uh, which is the Design Studio. So this Design Studio is something that you download onto your Mac or your uh, uh, Windows machine, and this is the tool that you actually use to build your integrations locally. So it's the sort of drag-drop configure interface that enables you to build your integrations. And the idea is, once you've built those integrations, when you want to run them in an operational context, you essentially deploy them to the Harmony platform, and then ultimately when, they, uh, when the time has come to run them, either because they've been called by an API or because they've run on a particular schedule, then they actually run on processes that we call agents. And there are two different types of agents. There are cloud-based agents and there are local agents. So we as Jitterbit maintain the cloud-based agents, so that's part of our fully elastic cloud. It means our customers don't do have to do anything in terms of maintaining the hardware that runs those agents. We scale it automatically based on demand. Um, uh, but you know, it, it does mean that your operations are then run in the cloud. 
and we recognise that for some uh, for some of our customers that is not a desirable or preferred uh, outcome, or even in some cases absolutely against their policies. Uh, so for those particular scenarios, we enable our clients to essentially set up a local agent that sits behind their firewall, and then whenever uh, just a bit integrations are run. They happen 100% behind the firewall. No operational data leaves the firewall uh, and goes through the through the Harmony cloud. It all happens inside your firewall, uh, and that allays any fears about um, uh, about security. So, just to give you uh, an idea of uh, how the uh, Harmony platform sits together, so what I'm going to do really is focus on the design studio for you, and I'm going to walk you through a fairly typical scenario that our customers uh, might use Jitterbit to solve. Now, uh, today, what I'm going to show you is uh, well, I've sort of some of the slides have sort of alluded to it already. Uh, a typical scenario where I want to integrate CRP. Uh, CRM and ERP. In this case, I'm going to use Salesforce and SAP that I have access to. Um, so let's just take a take a quick look here. So what I have here for us is um, essentially a clean organisation inside uh, Salesforce. So nothing is set up at the moment. I've got no accounts and I've particularly got no products uh, showing here. So my first uh, thing that I'd like to show you and my first sort of business requirement here is to use that data migration or that data synchronization approach whereby I know that inside uh, my ERP I have accounts already set up as my masters. Uh, I also have my product masters in there and what I would like to do is synchronize those from uh, SAP uh, back into Salesforce. So the way I do it in a Jitterbit world is I crank up my uh, uh, design studio uh, which looks a little something like this. I've already opened up a project so these objects down the left are the key object types that we have inside uh, inside Jitterbit. Um, I just highlighted some of them. So operations, I've started to talk about operations do particular tasks. We have transformations because, as I say, um, mappings are not necessarily just one-to-one. -one. You might want to add some sort of transformation logic between them. Uh, and we can also define things like your sources and targets here. Uh, so in addition to SAP and Salesforce, you know, maybe I want to call other web services to other endpoints. Maybe I'm storing stuff on FTP sites or querying databases. These are all defined as sources and targets. Um, and there's various other objects down there in the uh, uh, in, in the project structure. Now, what I want to do is just open one of these things, and I'll show you what a what a typical Jitterbit integration looks like. So, what we've got here is uh, an integration that consists of two in, in uh, two joined. Uh, operations. The first one is using our SAP connector and effectively what this is doing is just as its name suggests is getting the customers from SAP and storing them internally to Jitterbit. Once we've got those internally uh, in a structure that Jitterbit understands we can call the second operation which is basically taking that internal data structure and pushing it through or upserting it uh, into Salesforce. Um, I'm just going to click this little uh, uh, lightning bolt icon over here on the right to actually run this while I explain this and I'll show you some of the um, some of the features that we have here. So for example if I'm using the Salesforce uh, API to upsert some information about customers uh, then that's all defined in this um, this item here saying this is an upsert operation but what exactly is it upserting? Well this is a transformation here if I just open if I just double click this you can get an idea of um, how we map one system to another. So on the left here we have our internal structure that I built in the previous operation that says this is what a customer is as far as I'm concerned in this particular context. So it has these attributes. On the right here we have the structure that Salesforce requires. So all we've done is dragged and drop these uh, items. So let's see if I can find the facts. If I take this facts over here, there's probably a facts over here. Yep, there we go. So I just drag and drop it, and I've got a mapping uh, introduced into that particular um, uh, that particular element there. Uh, so this is fairly common. And the point is with Jitterbit, it doesn't matter if I'm mapping from an internal structure to Salesforce. I could be mapping from NetSuite to a relational database. 
it looks the same inside Jitterbit. You know, you have your source on the left, target on the right, you do some mappings, and sometimes if you double click on one of these things, you might actually want to modify that mapping a little bit further. So in this particular case, I'm just mapping the field city, but you'll notice down here I have a number of different categories of functions where I might actually want to manipulate that and transform that uh, based on these functions that I have down here. So you can see I have things like time date lookups, I have database uh, lookup capabilities, I have cryptography functions, I also have logical constructs in here that you'd find in scripting or programming languages, so I can use if then statements or case statements or uh, uh, sort of repeating loops to loop through various items. So you can actually make these um, uh, th these transformations or these scripts uh, pretty complex to uh, uh, to achieve whatever your objectives are. So hopefully at this point we've uh, we've had our operation run down here and it's done something for us. I'm actually going to bring up a slightly more complex one and run this just to show you that these things can actually uh, be a whole chain of events. Uh, the idea being that this is actually dealing with the products uh, and that's actually a little bit more complex because products are actually separated into a number of different object types inside Salesforce. So what we have here is we have uh, uh, first operation says get me the price book ID from my Salesforce instance. So you can see I'm using the Salesforce connector here. So that gives me the ID of the price book I'm interested in. Second operation, now we're dealing with SAP. So this is basically saying, get me the material list from SAP. In other words, all the products, pull those out of SAP. Again, store them in a temporary object inside Jitterbit. So once I have those inside the temporary object for uh, products, I can then upsert those into Salesforce. So now I have all those products inside Salesforce in this operation. But in order to uh, add them to a Salesforce price book, I need the Salesforce IDs. So this next item here is basically saying, okay, well, query the products, get me all of the IDs. And for each one of those products, call out to SAP and get me the current pricing of that project, uh, of that product. And when I have the pricing and the ID from Salesforce, I can then upsert them as a Salesforce price book. So by the time I run this uh, this operation, if we just quickly switch back to um, uh, Salesforce, let me see if I can find some products now. So we've done this replication, and now all of my products have been replicated as, uh, sale, as Salesforce objects in, inside my CRM. Likewise, because we had an accounts uh, replication, if I view all my accounts, you can now see that I have uh, accounts in here. If I just pick one of these at random, you can see that we've added some custom fields here as well. So this is showing me the SAP ID, uh, that in other words, sourcing the content from uh, SAP. Now, that's very much a sort of uh, one-way uh, migration type activity, but very often you want these things to be done dynamically, so we're now thinking about the real-time integration. So I'd like to show you that, and in order to do that, I've actually started to create a new account inside Salesforce. So I've just filled in some, uh, some basic values here as far as this account is concerned. Uh, so if I save this now, we've now got a new account object inside Salesforce but SAP knows nothing about this object yet. So at some point when I've you know, uh, filled in the relevant details here, I might choose to actually synchronize in a dynamic way uh, with, with my ERP system. Um, so what we've done here is we've modified the interface by adding this uh, Jitterbit to SAP button. So the idea is behind here, what I've got is I've got a rule inside Salesforce that says when, when somebody clicks this button, take the ID of this particular account and pass it to or call the Jitterbit API. And I've built an integration that says, you know, for this particular object, get all the details, in other words, the things that we can see here, and then uh, upload those into, uh, into Salesforce. And once that is all uh, run, what we're actually doing is pulling back the Salesforce uh, ID that we create inside SAP um, and populating it inside Salesforce. So if I just refresh this page now, now that the integration has run, uh, you can see that we have actually got a uh, an ID here. And if I copy that and quickly switch over to um, our SAP instance, 
if I have a look at the uh, customers inside uh, SAP and just paste in that, that ID there, doesn't like those bits. Uh, you can see that some of these values, well, in fact all of these values are the same. Uh, so we've got that dynamic uh, integration at, uh, at this particular point. We can also do this in a really sort of automated uh, uh, mechanism because now I've got this account inside, uh, uh, inside Salesforce. Let me create a new opportunity here and you can see uh, how this works in a uh, in a completely automated way. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to fill in some very basic details, a sort of mandatory set of details in order for me to create an opportunity inside uh, uh, inside Salesforce. Uh, let me add some products because now we have some products from SAP so I can uh, uh, just add a few of these products at random. So I have one of those, one of those and some of those. Uh, so let's select those products. Uh, let's have say three of those, a couple of those, we'll probably need five installations and one of those, that'll do. So point is I have an opportunity now with some uh, uh, some products associated with it and uh, a, a revenue amount up here. Now as far as the business flow is concerned what we would usually envisage is our sales team talking to our clients. Uh, we've actually got the proposal out there. If all goes well, at some point, hopefully, we can convert this uh, uh, this from a proposal into a closed deal. So, obviously, inside uh, uh, Salesforce, somebody comes along and says, "Yeah, actually, uh, this is now closed and won." Uh, so, when I click this save button, what we've actually done inside Salesforce here is we've built a rule that says, as soon as anybody creates uh, an opportunity with a status of 100% closed, then that is our trigger to initiate a Jitterbit API which then takes this information about this, uh, uh, about this opportunity and all the products and the pricing and what have you and creates the corresponding objects inside SAP and then a bit like we, we saw before if I was to refresh this uh, we will see that uh, we now have an SAP sales order number. So not only do we have an opportunity here, in fact if I click on the account name, bearing in mind I only just created this account a minute ago, uh, then obviously we've got the SAP uh, account ID for the account. We've got that opportunity that I created a minute ago and we've also got an order created here. So my Jitterbit integration has created an order inside Salesforce and the corresponding order inside SAP and I have the reference number to that SAP sales order. So I've completely closed the loop. The integrity is maintained across all of my applications and it all happens uh, through these integrations that, we, uh, that we've shown you uh, here inside the design studio. And at no point did I ever have to resort to any uh, uh, you know, Apex coding or uh, any BAPI coding inside uh, inside SAP. So the work of a business analyst is, is, is all, we're, all we're actually doing here. So hopefully that gives you a, a little insight into the power of Jitterbit as well as a bit of an understanding and how quickly these integrations uh, uh, can be implemented. Uh, so now that I've been talking for a little while, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you have raised some questions. So it's, it's at this point I'm going to ask Deb to uh, to step back in and, and join us with any uh, any queries that might have been raised during the uh, during the webinar. Deb, Hi, are you everyone. online? Have we got any questions? Yeah, we do. We have a question here uh, from Ian, um, and he asks, "Can you describe the error ma management?" retries, timeouts, etc. please? Uh, I can indeed, yes. So all the while, while uh, Jitterbit integrations are running, they're not only doing the job that they've been built to do, they're also uh, adding messages to a message log which can act as an audit history. That message log is also used for recording errors should they occur. Um, what we can also do is we can also react to those messages. So if I just quickly uh, switch back to the uh, design studio here, uh, this green line that connects these operations together is what we call an on success event. If I just configure this operation here you can see where I've configured it but you'll notice there are also on failure events here these on failure events basically you know should an error occur what do we want to do and the two options that you have here are run another operation uh, 
So that could be a sort of rollback operation, or it could be a retry operation. Um, or I could also trigger an email here, and again, I can obviously do both of those if I want to. Uh, so quite often we'll use an email template that is dynamically populated should an error occur or one of these on failure messages occur that then sends an email to somebody with the precise information relating to that failure event. So there are a number of ways that we can handle those uh, uh, sort of error handling uh, activities. Um, Hopefully that makes sense. I hope that's answered uh, Ian's question. Ian, if you need any further information, uh, Don uh, will be giving, well, actually Don's email is at the bottom of this slide on the screen. You can send that through. Um, Don, at the moment, I don't have any further questions from the audience, but we can wait just a minute to see if anyone else will be writing in. Yeah, okay, Deb, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, that's, that's definitely worth saying. Yeah, Ian and anybody else, if, uh, if you want to go into a little bit more detail on any particular uh, aspect that we've mentioned or perhaps something that I haven't uh, talked about today, then obviously this is just a, a very high level introductory uh, uh, webinar and uh, quite happy to go into more detail uh, offline uh, if you want to follow up with us afterwards. That's uh, yeah, very happy to do that. Uh, Don, uh, Roy has uh, written in, um, how do we, what is our license model? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, essentially, the way that Jitterbit licenses um, at a high level is really all about the number of endpoints that you use and also the, uh, uh, the sort of support level that you require. Uh, so, unlike other integration tools, all we're interested in is the number of endpoints. So, we don't have a uh, sort of a throughput or a transactional model. So, once you've identified how many different applications you're actually going to be connecting with, that's all you need to know as far as uh, a sort of sizing example is, uh, is concerned inside Jitterbit. So, if you have three different applications, you want to connect to, we don't care whether you push a million transactions through uh, through Jitterbit every day or whether you're just doing a thousand. It, you know, it, it matters not to us. That's not the model that we have. The fact is, you've got three endpoints. Uh, so that's the way we typically license. The other thing to take into account is we do have uh, different license packages from standard professional enterprise or it could go to custom uh, and there are a set number of uh, endpoints associated with each of those packages. Um, also, each package provides a, a sort of uh, an SLA regarding support. So, for example, if support is a really big issue for you, you want you know, uh, immediate support, then uh, you would uh, require a sort of higher level package. Uh, so those are the two factors really, number of endpoints and what sort of SLA do you want on, uh, on Jitterbit support um, uh, uh, service. Again, if you want more detail on that, we can uh, we can certainly hook you up with uh, uh, some of my more commercially oriented uh, uh, colleagues who can fill you in on, in the details of the licensing model. Thanks, Dom. Um, Roy, uh, we, we encourage you, if you didn't get the answer in full, uh, please do email us. Um, you could also email me at deb.smith at jitterbit.com as well. Actually, uh, yeah, just, just to start you off, I probably should have mentioned that if you just go to uh, jitterbit.com slash pricing, then you'll see all of those different packages and the licensing model is uh, uh, completely transparent and it's up there for everybody to, to review. So we do publish our, uh, uh, our pricing model. Uh, again, unlike um, uh, some integration providers who have uh, sort of hidden costs associated with it. So it's all out there, completely transparent. Perhaps that's the next thing to have a look at and then uh, uh, give us a call if you want more detail. Don, at the moment, I don't see any other questions on my board. Again, um, just sort of last calls here for questions uh, before we wrap up. Tom, I think we, um, we're finished. 
We're done. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for attending, everybody, today. I know how busy we all are. Uh, I hope the session was useful for you. And, uh, uh, yeah, as Deb said, don't forget, you can get in touch with us via the website uh, or, or directly with me, and I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll feed on any questions to other colleagues as necessary or, or answer technical questions myself. So uh, thanks very much, everybody.